222 day we will talk about SHX, XLM, and XRP because it appears as if Stronghold is the key to interoperability between all of them. And a lot of it today revolves around the ILP, which is a suite of protocols programmed to create a decentralized and universal network for funding money regardless of its type. And it's significant with Stronghold because they are a combination of Ripple and Stellar. And that is primarily because they are a product of the PayPal Mafia, because the chief technology officer was a d developer on the, the XRPL and Stellar, and their chief executive officer was responsible for a tremendous amount of growth at Stellar before starting Stronghold. And it is a long time fact that that Stronghold integrates with the ILP. And even Coinbase explains how Stronghold uses the Stellar consensus protocol as well. In the Stronghold white paper, it talks about interoperability. And it also calls out how it is interoperable with Stellar and the XRPL. I'm not trying to explain on my own the technical infrastructure of the actual ILP, and I'll explain it here in a second. The ILP was not actually created by Ripple. It is a product that was an open source protocol, and it is currently maintained W3. Here in the 2016 explanation, it provides a lot of information about what it is, and how it operates. I have pulled together the ILP white paper, the Stellar Consensus Protocol white paper, and the Ripple Consensus Protocol white paper in order to help explain how Stronghold and Stronghold Net are possibly positioned to provide the interoperability component. And I have combined the white papers in AI to explain how that is actually technically possible. All right, diving in. We've got some really interesting stuff to dig into today. You sent us a bunch of research on inner ledger payments mm -hmm. and um, this company called Stronghold. Oh, yeah, Stronghold. Yeah. It's like they're doing some pretty cool stuff with connecting different financial networks. Yeah, definitely. Kind of like navigating a world where, you know, every country has its own currency. Oh, I see where you're going with this. And there are no exchange booths. Yeah. No exchange booths. Yeah. Yeah, the research definitely shows a super fragmented system. So to kick things off, what exactly is this interledger protocol or ILP? What's the main idea behind it? Well, the IOP is basically like a protocol. It's a way to bridge these financial silos. Hmm. It's instead of forcing everyone to use the same currency, the same system, it creates this way for different ledgers to communicate. Oh, so it's not about replacing existing systems. No, yeah. But it's about connecting them. Right, exactly. Connecting them. Yeah. Think of it like a, uh, a universal adapter. You don't need to change the plug on your appliance. You just need the right adapter, right? So you can plug it into different outlets. That's a great analogy. That makes sense. But how does it actually work? How does it actually work in practice? Mm -hmm. The papers mention things like connectors and escrow. Yeah. So connectors are essentially, they're like specialized intermediaries okay. that maintain accounts on different ledgers. So they act like bridges between these networks using escrow to make sure that payments are secure. Got it. So let's say I want to send money from my bank account to someone on a totally different network, like mm -hmm. maybe one that's using a cryptocurrency. How would the ILP make that happen? Well, it would route the payment through like a chain of these connectors. Okay. Each one of them would be holding part of the funds in escrow until the whole payment chain is complete. So like if any link in the chain fails, the funds are just returned. Oh, okay. So it's like a safety net. Yeah. It removes the need for trust between the sender and the receiver or even between each individual connector. Interesting. So it's kind of like, I don't know, like a relay race where yeah. each runner 
holds the baton, passes it to the next one. Yeah, I like that. And if someone drops the baton, it's yeah, over. The race is over. Yeah. Clever. But the research also mentioned two different modes for ILP payments, mm -hmm. atomic and universal. What's the difference between the two? Yeah. So those modes address different needs and priorities in the payment process. The atomic mode is like a traditional bank transfer. It guarantees that either every transfer in the chain succeeds or none of them do. Okay, I see. It uses a group of, we can call them notaries, to provide this assurance. And this is ideal for high value or mission critical transactions where you really need that absolute certainty. So very secure, but potentially slower. Yeah, potentially a bit slower. Mm -hmm. What about universal mode then? Well, universal mode trades off a bit of that security for speed and simplicity. It's kind of like paying with cash, right? Yeah. It's instant, but you need to trust the person you're handing the money to. Right, right, yeah. So universal mode uses clever timing and incentives to minimize risk, making it more suitable for everyday transactions where speed is really what you need. Interesting. So the ILP seems like it's a very flexible solution for connecting all these different financial systems. Mm -hmm. But we also have some research on other protocols like the Stellar Consensus Protocol or SCP and the Ripple Consensus Protocol, RPC. How do these fit in? Are they trying to solve the same problem? That's where things get even more interesting. They're all dealing with distributed systems and reaching agreement, but their focus is a bit different. The ILP is about making payments happen between ledgers. Okay. Whatever consensus mechanisms those ledgers use internally, that's not ILP's concern. Right. SCP and RPC are more about how a single ledger reaches agreement, how it reaches consensus on its own state. Oh, I see. So it's like the ILP is building bridges between islands. Yeah, great analogy. While SCP and RPC are figuring how to govern the activity on each individual island. Exactly. Okay, great. So let's dive a little deeper into the differences between those two. What about SCP? The material mentions quorum slices. What is that? Yeah, quorum slices. So imagine this network where each participant gets to choose a specific group of validators they trust. Okay. And they trust those validators to verify transactions. And this setup allows for more decentralized control and a more organic growth of the network, right? Because not everyone has to agree on the same set of validators. So it's not like a traditional system with a single central authority. Right. It's not. It's more like a distributed web of trust. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, think about a social network, right? You trust information shared by your close friends way more than some random person you barely know. That makes sense. So in SCP, each node relies on its own slice of trusted validators. And all these slices together contribute to this robust and adaptable consensus mechanism. Oh, that's a pretty innovative approach to decentralization. Yeah. So how does that compare to RPC then? The material mentions that Ripple plays a more central role in their system. Yeah, that's right. So RPC relies on a predefined set of validators that are managed by Ripple which makes it a more centralized model. This can simplify things, make transactions faster, but it also means that there's more reliance on a single entity. Right, right. So each protocol has its own trade-offs. Exactly. Between speed, security, and decentralization. Right. And that brings us back to Stronghold and their approach, right? Yeah. They've actually combined the ILP with the SCP on their platform. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So how are they using this hybrid approach to achieve interoperability? So they use SCP for internal consensus hmm. within their own network, right? To make sure everyone agrees on the state of the stronghold system. Okay. But then they use the ILP to connect to external networks like Ripple's XRP Ledger, XRPL, and Stellar. So they're using SCP to govern their own house, so to speak. Yeah. And then ILP to build bridges to other houses. You got it. That's a great way to think about and it. And that's why they're claiming this interoperability with XRPO and Stellar, even though those networks use their own completely different consensus mechanisms. Stronghold has built these special connectors that allow them to speak the language of each of these networks. So they're like the ultimate translators in the world of digital finance. In a way, yeah. That's a good way to put it. So how does all this translate into real-world applications then? What are the benefits of this interoperability bridge that Stronghold is building? That's a great question. And that is something that we will explore in the next part of our deep dive. Stay tuned. Sounds good. Welcome back. So last time we were talking about all this interesting stuff with interledger payments and how protocols like the ILP, SCP, and RPC are tackling this challenge of, well, Interoperability. Interoperability, yeah, exactly, in the world of digital finance. Yeah, I'm already feeling way more informed about all this. Yeah. But I'm eager to hear more about what Stronghold is doing, you know? Oh, yeah. They really seem to be at the forefront of this whole interoperability thing. Definitely. And I'm especially interested in how they're actually making those connections work. Like, 
between the ILP, XRPL, and Stellar. Yeah, so it, it really comes down to their clever use of connectors. They've built these specialized translators that allow them to communicate with all these different networks, even though they have their own different underlying consensus mechanisms. Oh, okay. So these connectors are like multilingual diplomats, kind of. They're negotiating between these different financial territories. Yeah, exactly. They ensure that payments can be routed securely and efficiently across all these different systems. It's like Stronghold doesn't need to become a citizen of each network. They just need to understand their protocols, you know? Right, right. That's a much clearer way to visualize it. But I imagine there must be some challenges, right, to building and maintaining these interoperability bridges. The white paper mentioned things like security and scalability as being pretty complex. Oh, you're absolutely right. One of the biggest hurdles for Stronghold is making sure their connectors are really robust. Okay. Yeah. Because any vulnerability could potentially compromise the whole system, right? And that could erode trust. They're building bridges over a huge financial canyon, so to speak. Yeah. And those bridges need to be strong. They have to be really, really secure. How are they tackling that challenge then? They must have some pretty amazing security measures in place. Oh, absolutely. They're using the latest and greatest in cryptography. Okay. And undergoing these super rigorous audits to catch any potential vulnerabilities. It's a constant process of evolving, you know, and always improving. Right. Makes yeah. sense. And what about the scalability issue? I imagine that handling transactions across all these different networks could get pretty complicated, especially as the volume grows. Yeah, for sure. That's another really important thing to think about. Stronghold is putting a lot of effort into building a platform that can scale smoothly Okay. to handle all that traffic, right? Like imagine designing a highway that can handle rush hour without creating a huge traffic jam, right? So they're thinking ahead. They have to. About how these networks might grow. Exactly. It's not just about building a bridge. It's about making sure that bridge can handle all those cars going across it. Yeah, right. But it's not just technology, right? Stronghold also has to deal with all this complex regulatory stuff, mm. especially when they're dealing with cross-border transactions yes. and <laughs> multiple currencies. Yeah, the regulatory maze, that always adds another layer of complexity to everything, doesn't it? It does. It really does. But Stronghold is being very proactive. They're engaging with regulators and making sure their platform follows all the relevant laws and regulations in every jurisdiction. Oh, so it's not just a technological hurdle, but a, a legal and regulatory one as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. They need to make sure they're playing by the rules of every financial jurisdiction that they're connecting to. Okay. But let's step back from the challenges for a second and yeah. talk about the potential of all this. It seems like Stronghold is positioning themselves to be like the interoperability provider. Yeah, they are. Between these huge players in the digital finance world. That's exactly right. And that's what's so fascinating about it all, right? They're not trying to replace or compete with existing systems. They're just trying to connect them all. Which could totally change how things work in finance. It could. Absolutely. One of the most exciting possibilities is that it could create totally new markets and financial instruments, right? Things we can't even imagine now. Can you give an example of what that might look like? Uh, I'm having trouble picturing these new markets. Okay, sure. Imagine a marketplace for microloans. Okay. Where lenders from richer countries can connect directly with borrowers in, let's say, developing countries. Interesting. All facilitated through Stronghold's platform. That could completely revolutionize access to capital. Oh, wow. And empower people in ways we can't even imagine right now. That's a really powerful example. It's like opening up a whole new world of possibilities for people who've been shut out of the traditional financial system. That's the idea, yeah. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg, right? Think about how this could change cross-border payments, remittance services. Oh, yeah. Or even how you could integrate loyalty points and rewards programs across different platforms. It's like breaking down the walls between these separate financial worlds. Yeah. Creating this more connected and inclusive global financial system. That's the big vision, and Stronghold's platform could be the key to making it happen. It all sounds super promising. But we also have to talk about the potential downsides too, right? Yeah. Any system that handles money is going to attract people who want to take advantage of it. That's true. Absolutely. The potential for misuse is a real concern. Right. Stronghold knows this, and they're implementing really strong security measures. Oh. And working with regulators to make those risks as small as possible. So it's a constant battle to stay one step ahead. Yeah, it of, is. Of the people who want to exploit the system. Yeah. But like you said earlier, the transparency of these systems actually makes it harder for them to hide. 
right? Yeah, that's the interesting thing. The transparency of blockchain-based systems gives us a level of auditability that we just don't have with traditional finance. So that can make it easier to track illicit transactions. And maybe prevent crime? Hopefully, yeah. So the same technology that could be used for bad stuff can also help fight against those activities. It's interesting. It is. It's a paradox. But it shows how important it is to develop and deploy these technologies responsibly. We need to make sure they're used for good, not bad. Yeah, I totally agree. This deep dive has been so insightful. We've gone from the technical details of interledger payments to Stronghold's platform. And the challenges. And the challenges and the huge potential and the risks. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. And in the final part, we're going to tackle the most fundamental question of all. How does the ILP and all this interoperability actually change how we think about value itself? Stay tuned. Welcome back. We're finally at the last part of our deep dive. We've talked about a lot, you know. Yeah, we have. From the Interledger Protocol to Stronghold's vision for connecting all these different financial networks. Yeah, it's a big vision. It is a big vision. And now I think the big question... How does all of this change how we think about value itself? It feels like we're going beyond the traditional idea of just like money and assets. Yeah, it really is. It's a fundamental shift. The ILP doesn't care what kind of value you're talking about. Oh, interesting. It could be crypto. It could be loyalty points. It could even be like social reputation scores. Wow. If a system can represent it, the ILP can move it. That's pretty mind blowing. So all these lines between what we think is valuable. Yeah. They kind of start to blur, right? What does that mean for the financial world as we know it? Well, think about it. Intermediaries like banks, they've always held so much power because they control how money moves. Right. The ILP could change that. So individuals and businesses could potentially cut out the middleman. Exactly. They could transact directly with each other. Wow. And that opens up a lot of opportunities, especially for people who haven't been able to access traditional financial systems. Definitely. It could be a much more inclusive system. It sounds like we're talking about a more democratic financial future. But if there's less centralized control, how do we deal with security? How do we regulate all of this? That's the key question. It's a whole new world, and we're going to need new solutions. The old ways of regulating things might not work anymore. Right. We might need a whole new set of rules. We might. Ones that embrace how fluid and open this new financial ecosystem is. Yeah, exactly. But that's a huge challenge. It is. But we have to figure it out, right? Yeah. We need to make sure there's trust and stability in this new interconnected world of value. We absolutely do. But let's not get lost in all the complexities here. Right. Think about the possibilities if we get this right. Individuals could have real control over their money and their data. They could choose where it's stored, how it's transferred, all without relying on those traditional institutions. Yeah. Imagine small businesses in developing countries getting access to global markets. Yeah. Artists selling their work directly to anyone in the world, communities creating their own local currencies. It's all possible. It's a world where value can flow freely, really empowering individuals and communities. It's amazing, but it's also a little scary to think about how we actually get there. It is. It's a journey. But exploring all of these ideas like you've been doing is a great first step. Well, thank you so much for helping me understand all of this. I feel like I've learned so much, not just about the technology, but about what it could mean for the world. And that's what we're here for, right? To spark curiosity, to help you understand this ever-changing world we live in. Exactly. To our listeners, keep asking questions, keep learning, and keep diving deeper. Until next time.